It's a diverse and inclusive working environment. You get to sit and work alongside some of the brightest and best people at the bar. In some of the most challenging, interesting and stimulating work. We want to get the best out of a candidate. We roll our sleeves up and we get stuck in. We get some really fantastic work. We are spoiled with fantastic work. Um, and it's a very privileged position um, to be in, and it means that we deal with really hard, really technical, really interesting stuff that keeps us on our toes, keeps us engaged. It's really very satisfying. You might go into practice thinking, oh, I'm going to be a property person, and then find pensions fascinating, and you get to try it, and you get to see what you like, and then as you progress, you get to develop a, a, a specialism. And it's not something which you'll get from all chambers, because often, at other chambers, the sorts of work they do is more condensed within a single practice area. Wilberforce Chambers is a set that presents tremendous opportunities for members and uh, new joining members to get involved in some of the most challenging, interesting and stimulating work. We get to argue things in court. That is not something a solicitor gets to do typically, certainly not at the higher levels of court and, and, and with the frequency that we do. And it's so much fun. I think it's possible to have an image of a barrister as someone that sits in an ivory tower, advising from on high and looking down their noses at their clients. That is not the way to do it. We have to regard ourselves as part of a team, working with our solicitor clients to further our ultimate clients' best interests. And that's very much the attitude and culture in, uh, at Wilberforce. We roll our sleeves up and we get stuck in, ultimately to try and help our solicitors along that path. For pupils, what they can expect when they come in October to start their pupillage with us is they can expect that for the nine months of the assessed part of their 12-month pupillage, they will move through approximately four seats so they will have four different pupil supervisors who have practices across the spectrum of work within chambers. In that way, we are trying to achieve two things. We want them to be able to see the full spectrum of chambers work insofar as that's possible, because given we recruit, recruit with a view to tenancy, we want our pupils and we very much hope they're joining us as tenants, and therefore we want to ensure that we've got people who will work across our areas. But equally, we want the pupils to be able to see that spectrum so that if they want to specialise when they go into tenancy in, say, one or two areas, then they haven't missed out on an area that they might find interesting. I think I had two negative stereotypes about pupillage going in. One was that it was going to be brutal and competitive between me and my co-pupil. And the other was that I was going to end up doing a lot of very basic or menial tasks. In fact, both couldn't have been further from the truth. We were told right from the start we weren't in competition and I think Wilberforce has an almost unrivaled record of taking people on and that meant that we could rely on each other for support and guidance throughout the year. And in terms of menial tasks, in fact we were constantly challenged. Everything we were given was for the sake of training and development and to make us better barristers. The application itself will contain a number of standard questions that you get on every pupillage gateway application. But then there are also questions that we at Wilberforce have chosen specifically to sort of test the skills that we want to see from a written application. So, for example, there are years where we've asked candidates to describe a case that they found interesting and why, because what we're trying to get out of the paper applications is an idea of the analytical and intellectual abilities of each of our candidates. The members of the Pupilage Committee are all trained in fair recruitment um, and that's something that we take very seriously indeed. The second thing is that when it comes to actually marking applications itself, we have a real mix of people who are marking to try and limit unconscious biases and things like that. There are two stages to our interview process. We, having gone through what we call the paper sift and got our sort of what we call our long list of candidates, we have our long list interviews. They then give us the candidates for the second stage, which we call our short list. What you can expect as a candidate is that um, you will be given a legal problem. Um, you will be given that problem 30 minutes before the interview that you are to participate in. Before you turn up to Chambers and are uh, given that legal problem, we will have given you as much information as we feel we can about 
um, about what to expect from, from the particular day. So, for example, you will get an email explaining when you need to be here, exactly when you're going to be interviewed, but then, more significantly, the area of law that the legal problem will focus on. What we're trying to achieve from the long list interview is to very much get a sense of how someone thinks and how they analyse. We don't mind whether that candidate is someone who's done a law degree or whether they're on the GDL, and certainly GDL candidates should never feel disadvantaged by the fact that there is a legal problem um, that forms part of our long list. We have so many GDL graduates in chambers. We want to get the best out of a candidate. We don't want to give them some awful cross-examination that's just going to make them fall apart and have an appalling interview, because we really, really want to see the very best of you and the very best of the way a candidate thinks. Turning then to the shortlist, there will be a legal problem that's given to them. In the same way, they're going to get given that problem 30 minutes before the shortlist interview, but this time they're going to see a few more members of Chambers. There are rules in place which mean that all Chambers have to have some policies to deal with the fair allocation of work, but here at Wilberforce we go well beyond the minimum requirements. And it's an important part of our practice development process that we deal with the fair allocation of work. So there are three strands really to ensuring that. First of all, the practice management teams have systems whereby they record the work opportunities that come into chambers. I might get a piece of work because somebody has asked for me, could I you know, ask Joanne Wicks to advise on a particular problem? But it might be that a solicitor will call the clerks and say, I've got a piece of work for somebody of a particular level of seniority or with a particular practice area, who have you got available? And at that point, it's really important that the clerks record who they're recommending and why they're recommending those people. So that's the first strand. The second strand is that those opportunities and the allocation of them is monitored. We have an, an allocation of work committee that looks at it globally and makes sure that um, that there aren't problems arising and that work is allocated fairly across chambers and, and, in, and pupils indeed. And the third strand is that it's part of our practice development process. We have six monthly practice development meetings uh, with our clerking teams and we will have at that stage uh, a printout of the opportunities that have been coming our way, either ones that we have taken up or for whatever reason haven't come to us and that enables a real dialogue to take place with the clerking teams about whether or not uh, members of chambers are getting the kind of work that they want to get. The practice management team operates to support individuals on a day-to-day -day basis with their client support, with their practice issues, but also in relation to sort of managing diaries and the sort of administrative side of court listing and hearings. But they're also there as a professional guide so that members of Chambers feel they're supported, both in relation to um, flow of work and sometimes, you know, in, in a Chambers like this, that can be something that we have to manage carefully to ensure that, you know, people are, you know, not uh, feeling too uh, stretched in relation to what they're doing, but also in relation to ensuring they're getting the right opportunities. Junior tenants also get to work internationally from time to time by going and doing secondments either on um, the Ch Channel Islands or sometimes some of the lucky ones go out to the Caribbean, how lovely for them. You get to sit and work alongside some of the brightest and best people at the bar who are not only supremely intelligent but also incredibly grounded and down to earth and lovely people. And I can genuinely say all of my supervisors were very committed to seeing me improve, which made such a big difference over the course of the year. I think since I've started as a tenant, I've actually really begun to appreciate just how special and exciting it is to be a barrister at this set of chambers. It just seems like the opportunities are incredible, both to do my own unled work and I get the opportunity to be in court almost every week, but also to work on some of the most cutting edge big commercial or trusts or insolvency cases with more senior members of Chambers. And I feel very lucky to be in that position.